you've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it, but you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Buff here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is co living expert Ellen Perry. Now, in today's show, guys, we're going to be discussing the booming business of co living. Uh, founded by brothers and former bankers Christopher and Andrew Bledsoe, Ollie uses small space design techniques to reduce entry level price points for Class A apartments. Currently, the company has locations in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, Jersey City, Boston, Pittsburgh, and Los Angeles. At Ollie Owned Properties, residents enjoy fully furnished units and complimentary hotel-style conveniences like high-speed Wi-Fi, access to premium television programming, a weekly basic tidy service, monthly housekeeping, and a dedicated social club membership. On average, residents save more than $500 per month in added perks and complimentary services. Now, Ellen is, a direct, is, is the director of real estate partnerships at Ollie and joined the team in 2016 to lead the, lead the expansion strategy for the co-living platform on the West Coast. Uh, Ellen's experience in urban development, specifically on key projects in the downtown Los Angeles area, confirmed her belief in the future for micro unit development and co-living in the residential sector. And so, guys, I'm super excited to, to have a candid conversation with Ellen about a variety of topics revolving around the co-living concept. And I'm absolutely confident that you guys will find huge value in our time together. And so with that, I've got a few items I want to cover before we get onto the show with Ellen. First and foremost, uh, if this is the first time that you're tuning into the show, I just want to welcome you to our awesome family that we have here at the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast. Or if you're one of the many millions that tune in each and every a week. I want to thank you for coming back and, and really choosing our show because you've got a lot of choices out there in the podcast world, but you choose to come back to ours each and every week. So for that, I'm very grateful. And since it's loyal listeners just like you that make this all possible, like I do every week, I like to take a moment to give a shout out to uh, one very awesome listener who took the time to leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes. And this one is from Alex Olmo. And Alex says, I'm obsessed with this podcast. Kevin always asks the right questions of his super experienced guest. You're going to learn so much about multifamily and commercial real estate investing. Kevin goes into detail about actual deals with the guests. He explains methods, terminology, and analysis. So uh, with that, Alex, thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking the time to leave that. And guys, if you love what we're doing here, then please take a minute. It, it really is literally just a minute of time to subscribe to the show. Make sure that you don't miss any future episodes. And also, if you're so inclined, uh, leave us a five-star rating and review, and I'll be sure to give you a shout out on an up and coming episode. And just so you know, I, I don't ask for it. It's not an ego-driven thing at all, these reviews. It really helps us uh, gain some valuable feedback for the shows, uh, but also helps us attract awesome guests like Ellen here. Okay, We want to know that we're making an impact and that you guys truly are enjoying the content that we put out here. Uh, and just one other quick thing before we get on to the show with Ellen, just want to remind you guys about the free 30-minute um, complimentary phone call that I started up again. I did this for a number of years and I kind of went away with it for about a year and a half, but we brought it back about two months ago. Uh, this is where basically on Fridays, I open myself up for three or four different 30 minute slots at the end of the day where you can essentially jump on the phone with me and chat about uh, anything your heart desires regarding real estate investing. And it doesn't really matter if you're brand new to the business or if you're a seasoned investor um, and just want to talk shop. Really, this is my way to connect with you and to, to give back. Um, in addition to that, uh, I will be recording these calls. And so those questions that you are asking also will be used to help many others that probably have the same questions as well. And so if you'd like to schedule that call with me, you can go to my website, kevinbup.com and uh, just go ahead and click on the button, schedule a call with Kevin. It's about three quarters of the way down the right-hand side. Um, it'll take you to my calendar link, pick a time that best works. Just one quick thing though, when you're making that appointment, this is very important please put some notes in there, uh, whether it's specific questions that you have or a topic that you'd like to discuss. Please put some notes in there about yourself and the questions or topics you'd like to cover during our time together so that we can make the most out of those 30 minutes. 30 minutes flies by really fast when you're having fun. So I look forward to, to you know, interacting and connecting with each and every one of you. Now, guys, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest for today's show, Ellen Perry. Ellen, how are you today? 
Doing great. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you and, and, and talk about coding. This you you are the very first person that we will have on this show after, you know, I think nearly 300 episodes to talk about co-living. So um, I'm excited to dive into this topic here. And uh, just to give our listeners a sense of uh, geography, where are we calling you at today, Ellen? I'm here in Los Angeles. Ollie okay. has offices um, currently in New York, LA, and San Francisco, really representing the markets we're um, putting the most energy into it on our upfront expansion mm -hmm. strategy. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. And just in case, um, just in case the folks listening aren't familiar with what the co-living concept is, maybe we can start from the very basics. Give us a little bit of a background of what co-living means and you know, you know, where Ollie fits into that space. Absolutely. Well, when I talk about co-living, I like to start with the founding inspiration that Chris and Andrew Bledsoe had when they first invented our company over almost over 10 years now. Uh, back in 2011 is when they launched the brand, but they've been working on this idea since 2006. So it's been a, a concept that's been in the works for quite a long time. And it's always a little bit of a shift for people to think about what co-living is in modern urban multifamily America because it's a lot different from what you might imagine when you think of co-living and sort of the Scandinavian ideal of co-living and breaking bread out in a field. That's not what we're dealing with today. We're dealing with, you know, vertical mid-rise and high-rise assets and looking at ways to reinvent them for a, um, a modern urban resident. So when Chris and Andrew were living in New York City, kind of fighting it out in the housing market with their first jobs on Wall Street, they realized, um, from taking an outsider's a non-real estate perspective and looking at the housing market, they realized that there was this real mismatch between the multifamily units that were available and what people could afford primarily, and also what young professionals living and working in the city wanted to consume in terms of their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So Andrew had this really unique experience where he took a one bedroom apartment, he put up um, impermanent walls, set it up as a three bedroom micro apartment and he ended up living rent free in New York City because of the arbitrage he was able to generate with those two additional bedrooms versus the rent he was paying his multifamily landlord. But what Chris and Andrew like to say about that process is that everything about that was broken. Um, it was a bad deal for the landlord because he was leaving $2,800 a month on the table, he or she. It was a bad deal for the two roommates living in those you know, partitioned um, bedrooms that weren't really purpose built for their use, but it was the best they could find in that housing market at that price point. Um, so it was really this insight that a lot of multifamily that has been constructed over the last 50 years in the U.S. is repeating the same model that may have worked in that era, but isn't evolving and reacting to what urban life in America actually um, looks like today and what people really need. Hmm. Um, so our version of co-living is the combination of micro housing applied to space planning. So when we're looking at typical multifamily plans, we have a team of designers and architects who are experts on space efficiency. So we're looking at how efficient can the bedroom size be? How many bedrooms can we accommodate on the floor plate compared to a traditional multifamily plan? How can we set up the units with multifunctional furniture? So we're talking Murphy beds in each of the bedrooms that provide both a sofa and a sleeping functionality for that renter. When you do that, when you um, significantly increase the residential density of the floor plate, that creates a meaningful increase on the per square foot rents. We then capture some of that increase by reinvesting in the operating expenses for the building and giving the residents a much better lifestyle all included in their gross rent. So we reinvest in those services that they care more about than square footage. And that's really the key of what co-living I think in um, urban America is today. It's this trade off of privacy in exchange for lifestyle services and um, inclusion in a community and more connection with your mm -hmm. neighbors than you might find in the typical um, design, which can be somewhat isolating. Got so it. version of co-living is micro units with mm -hmm. services embedded in the base rent. What does micro mean? Give me a definition based on like your typical square footage or your typical floor plan. So at Ollie, we like to talk about um, a concept we call the price to privacy spectrum. 
So within a floor plate, we will have a mix of different unit types. They've all had micro housing applied to them, but with the different, different degrees. So on one end of the spectrum, we have a micro studio, which would be anywhere from a 300 to 350 square foot standalone dwelling unit, which we then outfit with furniture and hotel services. And on the other end of the spectrum, we'd have a three bedroom micro suite, which is about 690 to 700 square feet. We have three bedrooms and two bathrooms and a kitchen inside that footprint. What we don't have inside that unit is a living room because each of those uh, bedrooms have their own Murphy bed system. So there's no need for an independent living room inside that unit. Um, the residents additionally have access to the amenity space that we're programming in the building, which is where they want to be spending their time anyways. Mm -hmm. So we think about that range, but on an individual um, per resident kind of per capita basis, we like to see density around 200 to 250 net square feet per occupant. Mm -hmm. So we'll work with a mix of unit types, you know, two bedroom shared suites, three bedroom shared suites, sometimes four and five bedroom suites that do have a living room, micro studios, but we're always coming back to that rule of thumb that if you can get your density to 220 square feet per occupant, you're going to have some really exciting things happen economically, both for the residents and for the landlord. So we call that you know, density in a win-win outcome. Got it. Got it. So who is your typical demographic? So I, I'm married. I've got two kids, a two and a five-year-old. I'm probably not it, right? <laughs> so, well, so, you know, well I maybe I guess. I would count that a little bit. Um, first with the fact that our director of design is a, a mom who lives with her two sons in okay. 25 square feet that she purpose built for their lifestyle in New York. Now, that's a very urban um, example of family life. And, you know, it's not applicable everywhere. But we do think that going forward, there is an application of this model for family um, oriented living. But that's that's kind of gen two. So we won't go there yet. Um, right now, our core demographic in the shared suite product where you're renting a bedroom and you're sharing a kitchen with two or three other people mm -hmm. is typically a single person um, between the ages of 22 and 35 um, who's, you know, employed, has moved to the city post-college typically, um, and is looking to find a nice lifestyle-oriented housing solution but doesn't need to pay the rent on an entire one bedroom or even an entire studio apartment. Mm -hmm. So that's one cohort. We also get couples who are really, you know, cost-conscious couples doubling up in those bedrooms and, and we allow that with a little bit of an extra charge, um, kind of a membership charge for the extra utilization of some of the bath amenities and space that's there. The other roommates also have to agree with having an additional person in that bedroom. Um, in the micro studios, the thing we really like about the micro studio product is it allows us to put a um, unit in the building that's attractive to a much older demographic as well. So in the micro studio, we see a real barbell effect. It's, it's marketable to that, you know, 35 year old who's making a healthy income, who just wants a cool, you know, serviced furnished unit. But it's also marketable to older people who have gone through a change of life. Perhaps they're looking for a PA to tear in the city, baby boomers who are downsizing. So we pe see people skewing well over 40 in that more private version of the unit. And what we say is that everyone who lives in our building is part of the co-living community. The social programming, the events that we put on, the services are accessible to everyone. And we're bringing people together both on-site and off-site. So it's not just what's happening in the unit. It's this community that you're a part of by moving in. So hmm. if you move into a micro studio, it's just because you have a little, you're farther down on that price to privacy spectrum. You can afford to pay a little bit more for privacy. Got it. Got it. So that micro studio would either be a single individual or maybe a couple. Uh, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be necessarily shared between uh, two roommates per se. Right. So our brand standard, and there is, you know, different ways to slice this. And, and I think we're going to see a lot of different versions of co-living, but our brand standard is that every bedroom um, is a private bedroom. So there's no doubling up within the bedrooms. And we mm -hmm. like to do about a two to one um, bed to bath ratio. So if there's um, one bathroom in the unit, you know, we typically like to see um, two bedrooms sharing that and no more than that. Got it. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Now, I mean, we, we can, we can both agree that, there's a massive, massive issue with affordable housing. Uh, I mean, all the markets that you guys are currently in, right? That's probably where the affordable housing issue is the most severe. But I, you know, I, honestly, every major city in the U.S. has an affordability issue, uh, you know, with rent skyrocketing in some markets, uh, double digits for the last five, seven, eight years. And so do you feel that this concept, I know that this is kind of your testing grounds in the current markets that you're in, um, but are there other 
uh, I guess, less expensive major cities throughout the U.S. where you feel this co-living arrangement uh, would prove success- successful? Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that we advise architects is that micro is relative to market. So a micro unit in um, a lower density market like a Dallas or a Chicago might not be as efficient as a micro unit in a San Francisco or a New York. But the same rule of thumb applies. If you're looking at a multifamily unit, what is the opportunity to increase the bedroom count in that space and uh, reinvent the, the programming so that it's more oriented at that single professional who is really just trying to you know, earn money and advance themselves. They're not trying to nest and, and they're not saving, they're not getting anything out of every dollar of rent that they pay, right? Because they're not paying into a mortgage. So for that individual, it's really about how, how low can you get the gross rent and every dollar you save them on their gross rent is a dollar they can spend somewhere else or, or save. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. And so the current projects that you guys have, were these all purpose built from the ground up or were some conversions or all conversions? So thus far, our pipeline that's delivered has all been new construction. Okay. Um, our very first project was a 60 unit, all micro unit building in Kipps Bay, which is on the east side of Manhattan. Our second project was a mid-rise building in Pittsburgh where we have a mix of micro studios, micro shared suites, and some conventional apartments all inside the building. So we can play around with the mix. You know, once you get to these larger scale assets, it doesn't always make sense to have 100% of the units be micro co-living bedrooms. Um, And there's some demographic rules that we apply to sizing the unit mix. Um, And then our third project, which has been the most significant and really the most reflective of the Ollie brand, because as co-living has grown, the investors we work with have gotten more comfortable with the full vision and and delivering a product that's purpose built for this use. So the third and most significant project that's delivered was our um, partner's project, Simon Barron out of New York City. They delivered a 42 story tower in Long Island City. And Ollie's on floors two through 16 of that building with 422 co-living bedrooms, all wow. within um, three, two and three bedroom shared suite style units. Um, so that now is the largest purpose built co-living asset in North America. Um, we are also going into some adaptive reuse projects in the pipeline. We have one um, that hasn't been formally announced yet. So I can't give too many specifics, but it's, um, it's in Manhattan and it's an adaptive reuse. And then we're also um, pioneering a platform internally called Ollie Labs that allows us to come into existing assets and um, bring in some of the Ollie brand standard, but not go all the way there. So it's essentially a service that we provide for owners who have existing multifamily assets who would like to convert a chunk of the units to, let's say, um, the three-bedroom shared suite style. They could take some of their two-bed, two-bath units, partition off the living room, start um, providing services and furniture in that unit to increase the overall NOI of that unit type, and then provide all these um, community engagement services to the entire building. So we've got some ways of of separating the services and applying them to different assets where it's um, viable to do so. Got it. Got it. You just spawned a bunch of additional questions. I'm going to try to remember them all. Um, On the project, the largest project, I think you said it was 420 some odd uh, micro living units. And did I butcher that? Or is it more than that or less the, the largest project to date that you guys have done? So it's 422 beds okay. within beds. 122 units. Okay. Uh, let's speak about that project uh, more specifically. W- what did that lease up time look like? I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to gauge like the actual demand for your product. Um, you know, that's, a, that's not a, a huge building, especially in a, you know, very densely populated area, but how fast did you, did you meet expectations, exceed expectations as far as the demand of the lease up phase? So we're currently exceeding um, the building delivered in May of 2018. The anticipated absorption schedule was an 18-month absorption. That's um, typical for that submarket in in New York City with that scale, about 30 units a month. Mm -hmm. Um, We have been absorbing ahead of that pace, so we should be fully stabilized in July. We're currently at um, 75%, and we expect to be at 95% in July. So the lease-up's been fantastic. Um, we've also been getting amazing feedback from the renters. We got, you know, a New York Post article that said these rooms for rent could be the best deal in NYC. And then our renters tell us it's dreamy. They can't believe all the value they're getting because from a renter's perspective, when you walk into this beautiful room that feels a lot like a hotel room, it's fully set up. You know, you can show up with your dry cleaning and your laptop bag um, and it's ready to go. It's designed by an interior designer, of course. 
um, with Ollie's, Ollie's brand approach, um, they don't notice that their bedroom's a little bit smaller than it might have been elsewhere um, because the, the functionality they're getting is what they're paying yeah. Yeah, very, very interesting. And so from an from a, a operator's perspective, um, you know, what kind of premium, uh, you know, with this micro living concept, obviously there's a, uh, a, a rent premium that you guys get per square foot when compared to, you know, a normal you know, market rate apartment in the same given city or location. What is that percentage wise? I mean, what do you guys shoot for? So we shoot for about a 30% NOI premium. Okay. Rent per square foot goes up by anywhere from 40 to 60% when we're properly optimizing the floor plate, when we're able to really get, you know, the maximum number of additional bedrooms compared to typical multifamily. So our rent goes up by, let's say, 50%. Then we reinvest in the operating experience with the housekeeping, you know, that you mentioned that's weekly, Wi-Fi, social and community events, the two on-site employees we have, which are incremental to typical property management. So we do have a community manager and a hospitality manager, which provide um, coordination for the um, events and coordination of all the service providers that are in the units. Once you reinvest in those added costs, the net operating income is 30 to 35% higher than a typical multifamily NOI would be at that. Same Got, it. Got it. Well, that's exciting. That's exciting. Um, you know, you mentioned, I know you can't speak too much about it, so I, will, I won't press uh, some adaptive reuse um, uh, micro living spaces that you guys have got in the pipeline. Are they, can I, can I simply ask, are they, you know, uh, currently apartments or multifamily today or are they other types of commercial assets that might be readapted into a micro living use? So we've got both. Um, the okay. One of them is a, a conversion of an old office. The challenge wow. with office floor plates is that they're really, really deep. And so you can't recover that interior space in um, additional income. Because what we know is that renters are sensitive to the gross rent, right? So they've, they've got $1,100 a month they can pay on their rent and not a penny more. So if, you're, if your bedroom is 30 feet deep instead of 15 feet deep, you don't get extra rent for, for that extra interior space. They, they're really they're paying for the window line and for the functionality. Yeah. Um, so, we, so we, so it's challenging to convert commercial spaces into co-living, but we're now starting to test some prototypes, um, that could evolve that model, um, with these pre-configured, this is going to sound really futuristic, but these pre-configured, um, bedrooms that are actually furniture pieces that could go into an office floor plate, like a standalone module essentially. Um, but that's again, a gen two item in the existing multifamily uh, buildings that we're working on. What we look for is units that we can enclose living rooms in without doing any major structural renovation. So if you have, like I said, a two bed, two bath, we have a potential to come in there, just provide a partition drywall wall, put in a door, and then you have three private bedrooms and you, you lose the living room, but you give all of the renters a Murphy bed. So they have their own TV bed, sofa in their bedroom. Hmm. Very interesting. Have you guys rolled out that concept yet to where you're actually um, offering it as a service maybe to other uh, multifamily operators? We have. We launched um, Ollie Labs. I think the official launch was uh, either January of this year or, or December of last year. We have a, a, a partner on the team who's our director of Ollie Labs, whose full-time job is um, coordinating with multifamily owners who are interested in, in bringing Ollie into their projects. That's exciting. I mean, so we have a lot of folks that listen to the show that are operators of multifamily projects throughout the U.S. So, you know, please, you know, listen up, guys. You might want to go check out, is it ollilabs.co? Is that the website? You can just go into the ollie.co website. Okay. Um, you the partner with us form. And then depending on whether you were coming in with a development site or an existing asset, we'd route it to the right team member to help evaluate your project. Got it. Got it. And uh, one other question I wanted to ask, I, I forgot prior was uh, the, the average length of tenancy. I mean, is this a annual lease that you guys require? Is it a month to month basis? So it's really dependent on the investor we're working with and what their priorities are in and what the regulatory context is. So in okay. New York, um, all of our assets are covered by fair housing, which is yeah. just typical of a lot of, you know, a lot of buildings in that market. So we have all 12 month leases in New York. Um, which has proven out the thesis that this is this these higher um, NOIs are achievable under 12 month leases, and it also really helps because the assets themselves are strictly multifamily, so you get a multifamily cap rate on an exit. Um, in our Pittsburgh location, we have 
full flexibility on duration of stay with the, the regulatory context there. So we have some units that are operated under our co-lodging brand standard, which is actually a hotel style turnover. Mm -hmm. where people can check in for as little as um, a single night if they're checking in on a weekday, um, wow. two, two to three nights if they're checking in over the weekend. We also have three and six month leases at Pittsburgh and some tiered pricing there. So we think about it as um, you know a whole range. Our operating model is set up to service either the shorter term or the longer term leasing structure, and it depends on whether the owner wants to you know play for that higher higher risk yield or get just the you know core twelve month um, higher performing multifamily style units. Got it. Got it. What does that, that that pairing or the matching process look like when you have you know a, a shared unit? You've got two or three folks that don't know each other. Um, I'm sure you have an entire interview process and and um, have some science behind it as well. What does that look like? We do. So um, Ollie's technology stack is one of the key operating tools that we have to make these buildings um, really thrive. And the key piece of the tech East ecosystem that drives leasing is our tool called bed better. Uh, it's a little, little bit of a cheeky name, um, but we developed bed better as a solution to roommate matching and household formation leasing. When we looked at the existing tools that were out there, there were two separate categories. There was roommate matching and then there were traditional leasing platforms. What we've done is we've brought those together um, under one house. So you can think of bed better as a blend of, um, like the restaurant booking system, open table meets match.com. So if I were to go on bedvetter.com right now, I would see um, a whole bunch of different listings at different properties that are using our tool, or I could go just to one of our building websites and I'd see the, um, fire, the, the walled off and better availabilities for that building. And the, there's a number of different pathways the renters can take when they come onto the platform, um, depending on their priorities. So if they want to say view availabilities first, they'll just see bedrooms that are marketed with the per bed um, lease price. Or if they're interested in who they're going to be living with, they can say find a roommate or join a household. If they go down that path, it'll prompt them to form a profile and it'll ask them a series of questions just like you would on um, match.com. <laughs> and then it'll give you a compatibility score um, that's an intelligent algorithm based compatibility that identifies who is the best match for you based on timing, preference, and budget and lifestyle compatibility. Um, so this way, we're helping the renters make a good choice about who they move in with, but the renters are pairing with each other rather than us pairing them up. So the do they have, okay, so they have a, do they have a chance to actually interact before they make a decision um, uh, whether or not they might be a good fit? Yeah, so they have, um, to form a profile, they're connecting one of their online profiles, whether it be Facebook, LinkedIn, or okay. I think we just have to discontinue Google+, Plus, but yes, we have some profile integration. Um, and then they can meet offline if they want to, or they can, you know, just chat online. They can meet at the building for a leasing tour. So there's a lot of options available to them. Yeah, got it. I was going to ask, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you guys do background checks just like you normally would in a, in a standard, um, you know, rental scenario. But with, due to fair housing, you can't necessarily share if someone's got, you know, this guy's got a, you know, any kind of pass with, you know, potential roommate, right? You can't share the information. You, you, someone have to leave it up to them to go through this, um, uh, I guess, personality matching profile, you know, uh, test that you guys have, and then uh, ultimately make the decision if they think they'd be a good fit for one another, correct? We do. And, and the background and credit check is part of the leasing application. So we, we do. Speak. Yeah. Yeah. But that can't be shared with uh, two potential roommates that don't know one another. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't pass our test and then you wouldn't be in the renter. Pool. Got it. Got it. What haven't I asked you related to co-living and uh, this concept and the growth of it. A anything that you feel would be relevant for the listeners to know that we might have missed on? Gosh. Um, well, you know, one of the things you pointed out before, uh, before we got online here was that, um, you know, co-living seems to be kind of in its early stages. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just say, you know, we totally agree with that. We think that this product type has an enormous amount of room to grow um, and that there's versions of co-living that can apply both in the kind of smaller scale, you know, townhome style assets all the way up to high rise living. Um, one of the things that people ask me often, um, you know, I touched on a little bit, but it's how we think about larger buildings and integrating co-living within the unit mix. Um, so our building in Long Island City is a great example of this because we've got co-living renters on floors two through 15 and then 16 to 42 are conventional style apartments. Hmm. And what's really great about that is that the building itself provides an enormous amount of amenity space because it's a big building. 
So there's 20,000 square feet of amenity space with a gym, you know, with some roof decks, with a beautiful pool, um, some lounge spaces that Ollie built out. And if you're a micro unit renter, that's an incredible value for you, right? You're spending your $1,400 a month to live one stop outside of Midtown in Manhattan. You've got your 220 square foot bedroom, but 20,000 square feet of amenity space. People often ask, do we like to carve up the amenity space and have just like the co-living zone and then the conventional zone? And also, how do the conventional renters feel about co-living renters? And what we've found so far is that it's a really great enhancement to projects yeah. because you create more of a buzz in your amenity space. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to deliver this gorgeous space um, and then have it just kind of be unused or have it just be a leasing walk. Um, with Ollie at the building, we can do community events that everyone is invited to, whether they're, you know, a conventional renter living upstairs or an Ollie renter moving into one of the units that has all of our services embedded. Um, and then similarly, we can offer hospitality services to those conventional renters as an opt-in. So when we think about Ollie, um, we're really, you know, the core, the core um, disruptor for the housing market are these co-living um, micro units, but we're also creating an operating system that just enhances the lifestyle and multifamily assets. Yeah. So one of the things I always like to get across is it's not just about micro units, it's about um, enhancing the the management procedures in multifamily buildings. Yeah, yeah no, I love it. I love it. There's one other question I had is, you know, from its, if you had to simplify it, you know, we've got folks listening um, that might have an interest in, you know, going down the path of uh, Ollie Labs uh, that already own existing multifamily projects in different cities throughout the U.S. From its very basic standpoint, wh what are some of the steps that someone listening uh, would do or should do to determine if there's even a demand for this type of product um, in their given location? You know, whether it's, you know, Dallas Fort Worth area or whether it's, you know, I don't know, New Orleans, what would you suggest? What are some basic steps that one could take to determine if there's any demand whatsoever for the micro living product? Mm -hmm. uh, so the first thing that I would look at if I owned a building um, that had, you know, let's say I've got studios, I've got ones and twos and threes. If my studios seem to be in higher demand than my other unit types, that's a really good indicator because that tells you that there's people who need these more efficient um, lifestyle solutions. And we see that a lot. We see that studios lease up the fastest when these new multifamily buildings deliver. But mm -hmm. you're handcuffed by your, you know, your dwelling unit factor often. You can't do a, an all studio building. Ollie is a way to increase the studio-like product on your floor plate. Um, another simple question would be, you know, is your neighborhood an area that you see a lot of, you know, post-college young people living to? Are there a lot of um, restaurants and you know cafe life and uh, music venues is it that kind of thriving urban location because for mm -hmm. our renters the neighborhood really is there is their amenity um, and they, they they're willing to live in a smaller space because they're in a, a more interesting neighborhood or a neighborhood that's closer to their job so that's definitely a factor as well um, and I think you know lastly it's just a question of is this a, a market that supports higher density multifamily, you know, vertical multifamily that's uh, three, four stories and up. If so, there's probably a location in that market that makes sense for Ollie. In the more um, uh, like secondary and, and tertiary markets, we really need to be kind of in the downtown core, but there's still somebody in that market um, who wants this type of urban lifestyle. In the larger scale markets, we tend to make sense in almost every sub-market we can find a site. So. Interesting. Interesting. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground here. I, unless you think there's something else that uh, is, is uh, very important for the, the listeners to know, I think we've covered a lot of ground, Ellen. Um, anything else that uh, we, should, we should make a mention before we roll on to the uh, Golden Nugget segment? Uh, not that I can think of. Okay. Okay. We're ready Good. to grow for anyone who wants to test out co-living at their building. All righty. Awesome. Awesome. Well, the golden nugget segment. This is where we're going to work to wrap up the show. And um, you've already shared with us a ton of golden nuggets uh, regarding you know, co-living, the co-living concept. And uh, um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful show here with you. But if you had just one golden nugget left, you know, one, one in your pocket that you could share with our listeners that may motivate and inspire them as they progress in their real estate investing career, what would that one last golden nugget be? So for me um, in real estate, it's always been find the um, urban product that's inspiring to you and think about how you can bring that into your own investment. So sort of fo really following your heart. I mean, that's what drove me to Ollie and I feel like it was a really 
great decision and I've gotten to grow so much in my career being part of the growth of this company being at the forefront of this new product type and that only happened because I was looking at the product I was working on and and looking for where I could find more inspiration in the space and I think a lot of times people think of real estate as you know it's it's math and it's economics but I think there is a lot of room for creativity so it's just kind of let those sparks um, guide you and I, I don't think you'll go you'll go wrong. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing, Ellen. And thank you for joining on our show today. This has been a, a wealth of information. I was uh, uh, I'm very much a neophyte at the, at the co-living concept, but um, you've answered a ton of questions that I had personally, and uh, I'm sure that our listeners did as well. So really appreciate you joining us here on the show. And folks, if you want to learn more about uh, Ellen and, uh, and Ollie, just go visit their main website. It's ollie.co. Uh, O-L-L-I-E dot C-O. And Ellen, that is all we have today. Really appreciate you coming on and look forward to, uh, to following you guys' success along the way. Thank you. I enjoyed being here.